Welcome to the fall series, Methods of Protest Engaging Black Lives Matter Movements, uh, which is being brought to you by the Center for Global Ethnography. I'm Sylvia Yanagisako, one of the co-directors of the center. In, these, uh, in this series of live and pre-recorded conversations, we're bringing together scholars, activists, and artists from Australia, Italy, and the San Francisco Bay Area to focus on Black Lives Matter both within and beyond the borders of the United States. Our aim in this series is to broaden our understanding of Black Lives Matter movements in different areas of the world and to think collectively about how ethnographers can study Black Lives Matter abroad and in the United States by reflecting on both methods of protest and the ethnographic methods employed to study them. Today's event, Black Lives Matter in Italy, a conversation with Camilla Hawthorne, Torn Jones, and, and Angelica Pessarini is the first in our series. We would like to thank the Europe Center and the Department of Anthropology at Stanford for co-sponsoring this event, which focuses on the histories, geographies, and social and cultural processes that have shaped unique forms of Blackness, anti-Black violence, and Black Lives Matter in Italy. We're very fortunate to have as our panelists, three scholars who have extensive knowledge of the history of race, colonialism, and blackness in Italy, and each of whom has conducted ethnographic research on race in Italy. Our panelists are Camilla Hawthorne, who is assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa, uh, Santa Cruz, Torn Jones, a doctoral student in anthropology at Stanford, and Dr. Angelica Pessarini, who is on the faculty of New York University in Florence. Before we continue, let me remind everyone that this event is being recorded and will be available on our website. So you just go to irissstanford.edu forward slash ethnography, and you will find links to the video and a reading list that accompanies the session. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Torin Jones, who will be moderating our discussion. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are in the country and world. We are really grateful to have you here with us today for our discussion. Before we get going, with our exciting conversation, I wanna lay out some helpful information uh, for participants. First, um, I'll be speaking with, as a panel, we'll be speaking until 1 p.m. Uh, California time. And at that point, we'll open up the floor for 30 minutes of discussion, audience questions, but that does not mean you cannot uh, participate before then. So in the Q&A section on the bottom right of the screen, you can go ahead and put in any questions, uh, reflections, thoughts you want to share with us. Um, we can't guarantee that we will get to all of them, but we will do our best to respond uh, later on. Before submitting a question, you can also view what others have uh, said, that what they, how they've reflected, how they've responded. You can um, upvote and comment on the questions. And at the end, around, at the end of our conversation, around one, Sharika and David will help us um, work through some of the pressing questions we have. And we'll do our best to answer as fully and richly as possible. Thank you again for your participation. Um, and without any more explanation, we're gonna get going. So Angelica, Camila, Camila, thank you for being here. And I look forward to um, sharing our thoughts and discussing some of our research findings, our personal experiences and more. Um, to start out, uh, and good morning. Uh, actually, this is my first time I had some problems connectivity. So I'm actually uh, speaking to Angelica for the first time right now. So it's great to see you. Camila as well. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start. I'll pose a question to you first is, can you give me a little bit of information about how you got into your research? What are the key questions and themes that you explore? And what are some findings that have been particularly intriguing to you and um, uh, have spurred some further questioning and research? 
Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you, Torin, for uh, despite the technical challenges to be here, and Sylvia, David, and Stanford University for hosting uh, this event, which I think is very important. Um, so let's say that my research stems also from biographical, uh, from my autobiography, um, being a Black Italian, um, I've always noticed how this identity, saying that I'm Italian and I'm Black, very often create confusion or tension. And so, you know, the famous, where are you from question mm. is often followed by, mm, but where are you really from? Like saying that I was from Rome or I was Italian or I'm from here is, is never enough. And these questions were asked to me um, starting from a very young age, so as a child. And so racialized people in Italy, especially black and brown people, uh, they they have to answer these sort of questions very often. And so I was wondering why, why saying that I was Italian and Black was so difficult in certain cases to, to accept. And so I was wondering where was the tension coming from? I have to say that these kind of uh, answers, I couldn't find them on history textbooks. Um, I the, the, my family uh, originated from the colonial encounter in East Africa at the beginning of the 1900s. And I couldn't read my story uh, or the story of my family or people like me with this, with this connection uh, in history textbooks. And so somehow I started to dig it myself. And to do that, uh, during my uh, PhD in sociology and gender studies at the University of Leeds, I uh, started a field work. So I went to East Africa, I uh, went to Eritrea for five months, and then I went to Ethiopia uh, for another couple of months, and then I went to Rome for another four months. So it was a very long uh, field work, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and so I was trying to find the story of Italians born during the colonial and fascist period in East Africa, people who then moved to Italy in the 1970s. And so I had the chance to do interviews with two generations of people. So the first generation were respondents born between the beginning of the um, colonization in Eritrea, so around 1890 until 1935. So this was my first uh, sample of respondents. And then my second um, sample was those born after and, and those who experienced the racial laws and those who actually migrated to Italy in the 1970s. And I have to say, uh, there were many, many um, stories that uh, came out, stories that I've never read before, and stories that actually were sort of counter narratives to uh, mainstream historiography. Uh, when you study colonialism in Italy, um, very often, uh, especially, for example, in high school, um, if you have a paragraph on Italian colonialism, you are lucky. <laughs> um, even when you do um, modern history or contemporary history at the university level, uh, to find, to have an exam on Italian colonialism, very often you need to take a course on the history of Africa. Because if you take contemporary Italian history, you don't have an exam on Italian colonialism. So this already tells you a lot about the amnesia and the removal uh, and the underestimation that there is in general about uh, Italian colonialism. Um, and when we talked about, when we talk about it actually, very often the colonial experience is surrounded, is embedded in, in a very powerful myth, which is uh, Italiani brava gente, Italians as good-hearted people, Italians that, unlike the British or the French, they went to Africa and they brought civilization, they built streets and hospitals, so they were not uh, bad colonizers as others. This obviously is this romanticized vision of Italian colonialism is, uh, first of all, non simply wrong <laughs> because it was a colonial um, it was a colonial project. So as every colonial project was extremely violent, even if shorter, uh, Italians 
committed a lot of crimes in Libya, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. In fact, at the end of the war in 1945, Ethiopia released a list of uh, Italian war criminals that uh, they wanted to see going to, to trial. The problem is that in Italy, we never had the Nuremberg processes. So we didn't see public punishment of the fascist criminals. Uh, actually, it's quite the contrary. After the end of the war, those who were fascist yesterday, and that in 1943, they switched side, they were given a very important powers. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, is, there is a lot of... Um, amnesia in a way, but also this, as I said, kind of underestimation of the colonial uh, past. My respondents, uh, they were telling me when they came to Italy in the 1970s, especially those who were born in, in the former colonies from an Italian father, let's say, from people who uh, have like someone who had an Italian surname who was speaking Italian. Uh, so they were coming to Italy with, with a big uh, cultural Italian capital. When they come uh, to Italy in the 1970s, they don't exist. People ask them, but where is Eritrea? Where is Somalia? Uh, why do you speak Italian so well? So the same question that we're asked today, they were asked in the 1970s to these people who actually had a very uh, strong connection and ties with, with Italy. And if we think about what's happening now in the Mediterranean, oh, there is another connection. Many people coming are actually from Eritrea and East Africa. And they also come with having in mind the sort of connection, some ties that in Italy don't exist in the sense that are not taught about. So the findings of my research, I would say, were mm, kind of digging this hidden histories. So bringing to light hidden histories that really counterbalance the uh, mainstream historiography about Italian colonialism. Um, histories that were telling us about the crimes and the violence perpetrated, for example, on mixed race children, Italian mixed race children, and uh, the negotiations of identity. How, what, what did it mean to be black and Italian in a certain historical period were marked also by racial laws, for example. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was such a rich and intriguing and thought provoking introduction to um, like a fascinating world of your research. You've hit on so many topics that we're gonna uh, delve deeper into later on, such as colonialism, such as migration in the Mediterranean. So thank you so much. Uh, I would also, uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Camila Hawthorne. And if, um, welcome, good, ap good, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm so glad you could be here. And could you give us a little bit of introduction to your research, the questions um, you pursue uh, most intensively and some of your ongoing considerations that you have at the time? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And it's really, you know, what a, what a fantastic group, you know, Angelica, is one of my you know closest interlocutors. We've been doing a series of we, you know we've written a series of articles about Black Lives Matter in Italy um, and in the United States. Torin, I know we've you know had a lot of conversations about the Black Mediterranean, and you know Sylvia's work has also been a major source of inspiration in terms of thinking about the entanglements of you know nationalism and and political economy and constructions of race in Italy. So this is just very exciting. Um, so, you know, much like Angelica, I came to my research um, from a, a set of kind of personal um, and experiential concerns. So, um, you know, I sometimes call myself a, a Black Italian by a different set of diasporic roots and routes. My, my mother uh, is from Frescore, which is a small town in the, the Bergamo region. My father is African-American. They met and married in Italy in the 70s when my dad was drafted. Um, to Italy, you know, there's a whole other conversation that we could have about the particular branch of Black Italianness that's linked to, you know, U.S. imperialism and militarism. So, um, you know, I I grew up spending, you know, mostly in the United States, but also spending, you know, large chunks of every year with my extensive family in Italy, grew up with dual U.S. Italian citizenship, uh, grew up speaking both English and Italian. And, you know, what I started to notice over the years 
was that, you know, I would go to Italy and I would start to see, I would just notice more black people. And I would notice more families that looked like my family. And, uh, and I became really interested in, in learning about the stories of, of especially people who were, who were my age, but who had grown up in Italy, who were also black and also Italian and were navigating what is often sort of understood to be two um, irreconcilable subject positions. And I think also for me, it, it sparked my own curiosity in the, the pluralities of Black diasporic experiences, because for me being, uh, you know, the daughter, the daughter of an immigrant, um, you know, with dual citizenship, growing up with this Italian family and this Italian culture, there was a way in which I felt that my own lived experience didn't map on to what sort of maybe stereotypically understood as a, an African-American experience. And so I became really interested in, in sort of thinking about the ways in which blackness plays out in different geographical contexts. And so, you know, I ended up uh, pursuing a PhD in geography, partly because my training has always been very interdisciplinary and geography seemed like the kind of space where I could sort of smash together a lot of my methodological and theoretical interests and sort of generally think about contestations over racism and the way that they take place, right? You know, taking place and borders and the nation state as a formation seriously. So when I went to Italy for my first summer of pre-dissertation research, um, that's really when I started to learn about the movement for reform of Italian citizenship law. So you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but Italian citizenship is conferred on the basis of blood rather than birthplace like the United States, which has meant that there's you know, a, a whole generation, you know, estimates put it between 600 to 900,000 youth of color who are the children of immigrants who are disenfranchised. And that movement was largely being led by, though not exclusively, by Black Italians. And so I, one, became really interested in sort of, you know, again, understanding the ways in which people in that moment were really beginning to talk about a Black Italian identity in a coherent way, really for the first time, right? So prior to that period, I'd say in the 2010s, you know, there were a lot of conversations about Africans in Italy or immigrants in Italy, but I was noticing in this period a kind of fluorescence of discourse around Afro-Italianness or Black Italianness. And at the same time, this movement for a reform of Italian citizenship law, which had been going on, you know, at that point for, for many, many years, was also coming to a head in a really powerful way. And so for me, it became really interesting to start to think about the ways in which contestations over citizenship are not just, you know, in a kind of liberal framing about, you know, access to rights and privileges and responsibilities, but they're actually contestations over the racial boundaries of the nation. And so from there, you know, that led me to do a kind of two-pronged study, right? The sort of ethnographic side, which was the bulk of my research, which was working very, very closely with um, Black Italian activists and entrepreneurs who were in various ways trying to uh, promote or put language and practice around the idea of Black Italianness, whether it was through mobilizations for citizenship reform or through entrepreneurial economic activity. Um, and then on the other side was a, a more kind of historical, somewhat archival project, which was to really think about the ways in which the terrain of struggle in the present over who gets to count as Italian is shaped by a, a very peculiar history of racial formation that is very much a kind of Mediterranean Southern European story. And so, you know, much like Angelica, as a way of pushing back against some of the resistance that I encountered to my work of, you know, oh, racism is this new thing. It's only because immigrants showed up in the 90s or, you know, Italy was really only racist for a couple years during the fascist period, but really we're all mixed and, you know, everything's been happy-go-lucky. Uh, I found it really interesting to uh, sort of, you know, using secondary and primary archival materials, sort of reconstruct the, the history of these debates over the racial status of Italy, because it's sort of perched in this precarious position, right, where it's not quite Africa, but not quite Europe, right? Not entirely white. And the, the ways in which that very racial liminality has itself kind of produced a set of, you know, negotiations and also restrictions around who gets to be Italian that's played out in relation to the South, 
in relation to the colonies in North Africa and East Africa, and then in relation to immigrants and their children. And I think what was really interesting for me, so, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just about finished with my book manuscript and I've been sort of able to step back from, you know, I've been working on this project since 2012, so sort of eight years of research and track a kind of narrative arc in these movements. And I think what's very interesting to me is that when I started my project, there was a, a real investment in the power of citizenship and the potential of citizenship as a way of challenging the exclusions of the racial state. And over time, what's happened is that it's not that activists have let go of citizenship, right? You know, citizenship is, you know, for all of its exclusions, it is, in, you know, at an experiential lived level, it's materially significant. But there's a way in which a lot of the activists who I've worked with have moved toward a more expansive understanding of what these Black Italian politics and mobilizations look like and who can be included. Right. So like when I was in Italy in 2016, there were these really heated conversations, very fraught conversations around sort of how the movement for citizenship reform relates to or doesn't relate to the struggle for the rights of refugees. Right. Because if the Italian state is always framing resistance to citizenship reform as a problem of, you know, oh, these foreigners who want to become citizens, then those activists whether or not they want to have to sort of invest in a particular narrative that, you know, we're born here, we're citizens of this place, we are Italian. And so many people expressed a real discomfort, right, with that kind of that liberal politics of, of inclusion and recognition that meant for some people like having feeling like they had to throw their own parents under the bus, the generation of their parents to say we're not immigrants, right? And over time, I think, you know, when the, the citizenship reform bill was defeated um, in the Italian legislature at the end of 2017, and then the very far right government was voted in in 2018, there was a way in which it almost cracked open a new set of political possibilities and a new set of political alliances to the, the point that, you know, I think now, and this is something that Angelica and I have written about, watching these 2020 Black Lives Matter demonstrations in Italy, in a lot of places, you're really seeing these explicit efforts to link the question of citizenship to the fortification of the Mediterranean border and the exploitation of migrant labor as a way of saying these are, these are all Black Italian issues. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much. What I love is that we have kind of Angelica giving us a, a really deep dive into the colonial histories, the racial legacies that carry forward. And you're giving us a really uh, deep dive into the contemporary politics and how they, of course, overlap in terms of Angelica, Angelica's research, your interests. We have a really broad, I think, temporal and spatial spectrum to deal with as we consider uh, race making and the politics of blackness and BLM in Italy. So thank you so much for sharing that. And of course, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to see you. I, uh, before we delve into questions about colonialism a bit more deeply, I'm going to give a brief introduction for uh, myself. I'm currently finishing up my dissertation at Stanford in the anthropology department. My research focuses on race in Italy and Sicily specifically um, from the lens of uh, migration and refugees and human refugees and humanitarianism. So I work with a, a group of quote unquote protected migrants who are known as unaccompanied foreign minors. And, and I look at the ways in which they as they're legally minors, teenagers arriving in Italy. How do they learn about what being it being in Italy means the racial categories, the gender categories, the politics of being Black in Europe, of questions of non-belonging. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand kind of the really deeply emotional, mental, uh, psychic community processes that are taken up by these relatively young, uh, young, most primarily men uh, in their first time in a European space. And so I think there are interesting resonances with both uh, Angelica, Angelica's questions and your questions, but uh, and what what kind of has gripped me the most is that I was raised in the U.S., where races, where discourses around race are not always fun and fruitful, but have been prolific for a long time. And so, working with a group of people who are for their in their first time encountering white uh, predom a predominantly white society has been one fascinating because I had to learn that so many things that I took for granted about racial knowledge, about interaction across race, about just how race worked. I got to 
watch people learn this and figure out what it meant. And part of it is just profoundly heartbreaking. I mean, a lot of it is not happy stuff. But at the same time, I get to really understand that race and understandings of race at the interpersonal, at the emotional, at the deeply effective levels are not set in stone. They're up for, they're up for change, they're up for debate. They are highly fluid. And so watching these challenges are fascinating. And what I find also to some of Camila's points is that people do, young, young people do, young black people, young migrants, some Africans stay very up to date on Italian, Italian politics. They know what's going on at the, legislature, at the legislative level. They see the discourse nationally. And this has a deep impact on what they believe is possible and impossible in Italy and Europe beyond that. And so one, I'm excited to speak to you both. And I'm really excited about the ways that our research both differs and overlaps uh, in pretty profound ways. I want to go back to one of the, I think, fundamental issues that um, Angelica raised that you've touched on too, Camila, which is African colonialism. So we have East Africa, but we also have North Africa that I noticed tends to follow up with the frame a little more when we speak of Italian colonialism. We know that there were kind of, there was mass, uh, violence, mass murder, I would say, by the Italian state in both North and East Africa and a really intense uh, colonial period. One thing I hear is that from Italians is that, oh, it wasn't as long, it wasn't like other European colonial practices. It was just a few years and it was maybe not so intense. And so one, I would like to turn turn back to Angelica and tell us, how do you really address um, maybe potentially political pushback or kind of doubt and suspicion around questions of colonialism in Italy and how is that, what kind of insights might you have developed uh, there more generally? Thank you, Torin, uh, also for telling us about your research that sound fascinating and definitely there are so many interconnections here, it's really, it's really exciting. Um, so the, the colonial uh, past and the colonial crimes especially, um, they are a kind of sore nerve, I would say, in the sense that um, for so long, uh, there was a denial mm, that Italians even committed crimes. Uh, I think about the use of um, chemical weapons and how this was very warmly denied by historians uh, throughout the 70s, the 80s, is just in 1989, then finally when the archives were open, we could see that the evidence that uh, Italians used um, chemical weapons. But until that time, uh, besides uh, one historian that really was pivotal, I would say, in this, in this research, that is uh, Angelo Del Boca, who was really trying to document and extensively writing about the crimes committed by Italians. All the others were kind of denied. And in the, obviously Indra Montanelli, for example, was the first one <laughs> in the line denying the use of, of, the, of the weapons. And it's interesting because although people, some people would like to put colonialism in the past and the crimes in the past is interesting how they are still very alive in the present, especially now. Uh, I have to say, I think in Italy, we can say there was a pre-George Floyd and a post-George Floyd in mm -hmm. the sense that this death and the reactions that the US showed to the world, uh, they really affected everywhere. And they affected Italy too, because there was a real encounter with the Black Lives Matter movement in Italy. And so even here, we started to ask questions about the past and be critical. And the conversation have been really challenging. Uh, what I noticed, for example, is on the one hand, uh, a lot of denial. A, a denial also from those who are um, so-called anti-racist. Mm? So people of a certain age who maybe were also active in uh, anti-racist fights from the 60s, uh, where unfortunately the race component did not exist, did not have 
any any sort of space in the debate. Um, so we're talking about gender and sexuality and class, but race was never in the picture. And now suddenly we talk a lot about race. So I notice denial and especially um, insinuating that um, racism doesn't exist in Italy because we don't have race, because we don't mention race. As you said uh, earlier, we don't have a language, unlike the US where it's everything about race in a way or another. In Europe, we have this very strong color evasive approach where race doesn't exist. And so we cannot even name it. Um, just let's remember that in 2018, France erased, it was voted to erase the word race from the constitution because it was considered as discriminatory. And so we are really in a, in a very paradoxical situation where there is a, a massive problem, but we cannot name it because just the fact to name race is racist in itself. So we have to fight with a lot of contradictions in terms to talk about these matters. And colonialism is one of those because race was a main component of the colonial project. Um, I was listening to Camilla earlier talking about the citizenship. And if something really connects our work is citizenship, because this idea of blood and citizenship is something that in Italy have been discussed forever in the sense that already in 1909 in the colonies, uh, the Italian government had to think about Italian citizenship for mixed race kids born in the colonies. So there were a lot of brown kids born from Italian fathers and uh, they could be recognized as Italians if the, if the father was recognizing them. And so they were Italians. Uh, like no doubt, but if they were not recognized, these kids could get Italian citizenship by showing their Italianness. And the criteria used was uh, anthropological. So the, the code used in 1909 to define Italian citizenship for these kids was to show sign of Italian blood, meaning looking, having certain phenotypical features. So this was 1909, so it was well before the fascist regime. The fascist regime used this kind of codes to uh, talk about citizenship in different terms. And so in 1933, uh, the way to get Italian citizenship for these kids who were uh, not recognized by their white Italian fathers was to show signs of the white race. So the terms were changed, but was whiteness that was giving you Italianness. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, the governor of uh, the Lombardy region, Attilio Fontana, 80 years after the establishment of the racial laws in 1938, 80 years later, he said that uh, talking about refugees, we cannot take them all, otherwise our white race Mm -hmm. is going to be erased. So you can see it's really a circle here. Uh, and so it's interesting to see how race is really at the core of Italian society. And uh, still, we really struggle to, to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, that resonates so much with so much with lo a lot of what I found in that. Uh, Oh, I'll give an anecdote. One time I was in a meeting for migrants about, about how to properly legally uh, administer kind of care and psychological care in migrant centers. And it was led by uh, uh, one of my friends actually, who was born in Senegal and has had since maybe decades ago married. An Italian woman is, is an Italian citizen and he was leading the meeting in Italian and at, and he was kind of throwing in some Sicilian dialect into the things that he was saying. And someone stops the meeting and says, oh my God, it's as if uh, he's, he speaks just like an Italian. And he says, I am an Italian. <laughs> and so it's just these moments of like clearly racialized um, citizenship bound citizenship and belonging boundary making i can i i see how they one have been so deeply established in the colonial period and how like you mentioned they just keep replaying and recurring in different manifestations today i would like to ask um 
Camila, you also turned to the question of uh, co uh, colonialism and its legacies today. Do you have any reflections either to what um, Angelica just gave us, kind of the rich historical narrative and its relationship to the present or any of your own unique findings that uh, are really uh, either pertinent or intriguing to you? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, the colonial period is really, is very important for the story that I'm telling as well. And as Angelica said, you know, citizenship is one of the themes that really connects our work. Uh, you can't talk about contestations over citizenship in contemporary Italy without taking the colonial past really seriously. And as Angelica pointed out, particularly with the case of the 1909 laws, it's important to remember that, um, colonialism as well as the racial theorizations and racial laws that undergirded colonialism that's also a that's not just a fascist story but it's a liberal story right that goes to the heart of the italian nation making process itself and if anything i think one of the things that um, and you know, I think that both Torn and Angelica both of you have alluded to this what makes italy a, a really provocative place to do this kind of research about the entanglements of race and nation and citizenship is, you know, the one, the relatively late nation formation in Italy, uh, the, the questions of kind of racial ambiguity or liminality because of this, you know, the, the question of Mediterraneanness, as well as the fact that, you know, national unification was happening almost contemporaneously with colonial expansion. And so post-colonial theory tells us, right, that, you know, the, that the, the, you know, Europe is formed relationally with its colonies and Italy sort of takes that to a, make, creates a kind of limit case of that, where we see that, you know, taken to its most extreme end, that literally the formation of the nation state and the consolidations or contestations over Italian whiteness are happening in relation to the process of colonial expansion. You know, one of the things that I've that I found really fascinating as well, you know, especially when thinking about the the differences between northern and East African colonialism, you know, and this is not at all to minimize the the horrific, the genocidal violence, right, especially in Libya, but that we see these racial theories about you know, varying degrees of Southernness also playing out in relation to the colonies. And so what's interesting for me is to track the way in which that dividing line between, um, let's say, Europeanness and Africanness or um, Italianness and its others is always being negotiated in relation to different Souths, right? So you have the internal line, North and Southern Italy, then you have, you know, the Mediterranean, right? So the Italian peninsula and then the African continent, but even within the African continent as well. And so, you know, even with Libya, right? There was a sense, particularly um, with the fascist government that there was more of a civilizational connection to Libya via the Roman Empire than there was to the Horn of Africa. And so because of that, there was even a gradated system of citizenship, right, between um, Italians in Libya, Libyans in Libya, um, and then, you know, um, uh, East Africans from the Horn of Africa, that there were actually, there was actually gradated access to citizenship that was based on sort of the, the civilizational, racial, anthropological distance from Italianness, from Romanness, you know, when, when the Roman Empire becomes a kind of important cipher for these sort of revanchist um, as colonial aspirations. And I think kind of expanding outward to the, the broader themes of this event, the fact that this colonial history is so important, I think is one of the things that requires a kind of geographical and historical specificity when we think about what Black Lives Matter means in Italy, because it's a story that is perhaps, it's less directly tied to enslavement and chattel slavery, although that is still part of the story. And it's, it's much more directly a kind of trans-Mediterranean colonial story. And so, you know, one of the ways that I like to think about this is that I think in the United States, sometimes when we're talking about Black struggles, there's often a way in which, both in terms of disciplinary formation in academia, but also in the way that uh, kind of liberal politics divides up the work of social movements that, you know, combating racism, right, that's a Black issue, and dealing with border fortification, right, that's a Latinx issue, and dealing with settler colonialism is a, is a Native issue. And in Italy, 
all of those things are collapsed onto each other, right? Because, you know, black folk who were former colonial subjects are crossing borders and encountering the racism of the immigration and citizenship apparatus. And so it's a, I think it actually provides a really important reminder, even in the United States, when it's slightly easier to pull these things apart, that actually we have to understand the formation of national borders and struggles over citizenship and anti-Black racism and colonialism is all really connected in terms of the, the formation of the modern world. Thank you, thank you so much. One, you've given us, thank you for tying it back to questions of contemporary Black Lives Matters and also pointing out some key uh, legacies. You've offered us a perfect segue into our next topic, which is how do we think about the Mediterranean and all of this? And so I actually, um, well, what I want to respond, just one thing you said briefly, which is the question of the South, where is the Italian South? And it's, uh, I think you point out perfectly that there are many Souths at a point also, I think Gramsci also made as well. But how, do, like, for example, when I, I would, I, most of my research unfolded in Southern and Eastern Sicily, but I've also had the chance to be in other parts of Northern Italy. And I would find that different people point to different places as the beginning of the Italian South. I've heard it starts at Rome. I've heard it starts at Bologna. I've been in Palermo and heard that it starts in Ragusa, which is much further south in Sicily. And so there's many different ideas of where the South begins and there are many Souths. And I also had a funny, funny, problematic, intriguing experience of having different parts of Sicily be referred to me as like uh, L'Africa. This is, Africa is there. It's really hot there, it's humid, that's Africa. and just, but people always pointing further south because they clearly did not want to be called Africa, but they could always point to other Italians that were for them uh, representative of maybe for potentially too far south. And so this question of many Souths and racialization and nation formation are, as you said, just so deeply tied together that it's, it doesn't parse out in the same ways as we might think in the US. Um, but could I follow that up with you telling us a little, little bit about what you've done or questions and research you've done around the black Mediterranean and some of both the, the political and kind of geographic struggles you've um, looked into? Camila, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Would, should I, are we going in the same yeah. order or should I just? I only, I turned the Mediterranean too because you've published a pretty important piece called the Black Mediterranean. And so that's why I turned to you, but we can also go to Angelica. It's open either way. Would, uh, do you want to go first, Angelica? Okay, yes, uh, sure. Uh, although, yes, uh, obviously I really, uh, Camila's work on the Black Mediterranean for me was really, was really important to conceptualize a bit this idea that I think mm, is now uh, so important. However, to think about the Black Mediterranean, again, for me, uh, I thought about the past. Uh, so I really try to see how the past is really, the connections with this past cannot be uh, cut off so easily. And so talking about uh, what you guys were saying about the mini South, uh, I I'm always fascinated reading the testimonies of the, of the Italian patriots who, from the north, arrive, uh, arrived to, to the south, to, to Napoli and Palermo, that were incredibly buzzing cities, uh, much more advanced on, on, on certain levels. And especially, I remember Luigi Farini, who writes in his diaries, this is not Italy, this is Africa. And it's really interesting how they see uh, the patriots coming from the north, see the south, as something alien and something different. Uh, I've been to Sicily for a few weeks uh, this summer and you, you notice how, in a way you, you may understand, Sicily was an emirate um, for some time. There is a unique architectural style in Sicily, the Arabo Normanno, that is unique in the world. You cannot see it anywhere else. And so the South was different. However, I find fascinating how um, the South was whitened by the fascist regime in order to find the new other. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was lucky because there were a number of publications that came out and they were really uh, pivotal. Uh, I think about uh, Il Bianco e il Nero, for example, by Gaia Giuliani and 
Christina Lombardi Dio. That publication for me was really important because especially um, Gaia's work was really showing this whitening, uh, uh, this whitening project. So how the South was whitened to, uh, in order to um, go to Africa and to find the, the, the real Blacks. We have to say, uh, obviously, how difficult it was for Italians to be seen as white, first of all. When they go, we know when we go, uh, when they go to Ellis Island, when they go to Louisiana, picking strawberries, they live with blacks. They live in the same neighborhood. They do the same job. Uh, they are lynched. Uh, one of the biggest mass lynching involved Italians. So um, there was a discrimination, but I think how, uh, and here, the, another great book um, by Jennifer Guglielmo, Are Italians White? They, they show us the difference between race and color because they were socially black, but at some, at some point in history, they become white. And so this process of whitening, I think, is really crucial. And uh, Mussolini managed to use the Mediterranean, really the Mediterranean category, to whiten the country and to finally have our place in the sun. And Italians become white in opposition to Africans. So it's always in opposition to something. The present is really interesting because uh, if you think about um, the work of Lega, Lega was a party that was called Lega Nord, Northern League, precisely because the idea was to separate the efficient North from the lazy South. And then Salvini arrives and he does something incredibly smart. He removed the word North. And so Lega become Lega for everyone. And this is an absolutely winning strategy because now Lega is one of the most voted party in the South, in Calabria, for example, in Sicily. That's and so you notice to... how Salvini, like Mussolini in a way, whitened this country in opposition to whom? To African migrants coming from the Mediterranean. So... For me, the past is always a source of really interesting uh, conceptualization about Italian identity and Italian whiteness. And now this Black Mediterranean, that is so important. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, one, I really appreciate that you put on the current electoral politics and the deep, pretty relatively explicit racism there in regarding North, South, whiteness. Blackness, migrants. Uh, we're definitely going to delve into that more deeply in the next section. Uh, before then, I want to ask one, could you, I noticed we had a question regarding, um, you mentioned lynchings, Italian lynchings in the U.S. You're referring to the ones that occurred in Louisiana, is that correct? The state of Louisiana. There's been a, there was a very famous book written about it. The name has escaped me, but I, um, I know there was a question there. If you have any more information, uh, please share it now or I can follow up later. Uh, on that Q&A. Also, I, um, that said, I would like to turn to Camila. What information or what findings, what thoughts, and actually what really kind of galvanized you to think critically uh, about the cultural, ge political, cultural geographies of the Mediterranean and how have you, um, how does that really continue to inform your work and how you think about contemporary struggles around race in, uh, in, in Italy? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I started thinking critically about the Mediterranean because I was finding that there were ways in which Mediterraneanness was being used, particularly by white leftists, as a way of making a set of claims about how race does or doesn't work in Italy. And so, you know, I was, you know, often encountering, you know, uh, discourses of um, racial ambiguity, you know, histories of Italian racial ambiguity. Uh, southernness of, you know, Mediterranean mixedness, right? You know, we're, you know, how can we be racist? We're not even really white. You know, Italy is a crossroads of civilization that I found were, were you know, really papering over and often being used to delegitimate claims about anti-Black racism in the present. And yet at the same time, you know, as a, you know, someone who's trained as a geographer, I do, you know, I, I like believe in taking space and place really seriously. And so for me, I started really grappling with this question of the Mediterranean as a way of thinking, you know, how do we both understand what is specific about these histories of racial formation and racial capitalism in the Mediterranean, but without also reifying a kind of Italian exceptionalism, right? And this is, um, 
just as a as a shout out, this is also something that um, our colleague Ilaria Giglioli does in her work as well, but thinking specifically about the connections between Sicily and Tunisia and the political uses of, of Mediterraneanism. So, you know, inspired by, you know, a lot of work that, that came before, I came to the Black Mediterranean as a way of thinking about the specificities of, of Black life and Black struggles in the Mediterranean and all the ways that they don't always map super neatly onto a kind of Black Atlantic story, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is a way in which, and you know, scholars in the field of Black European studies will sometimes refer to this as African-American hegemony. I'm not sure if that's necessarily a term I agree with, but you know, it is undeniable that the Black American experience does sort of, it is a kind of center of gravity in terms of conversations about global Blackness. And there's often a kind of assumption that what is a, a set of Black American experiences um, can stand in for the plurality of Blacknesses around the world, right? And so, you know, what happens when we move to a place like Italy where, you know, the majority of Black people uh, are not the descendants of enslaved people, have not come to Italy via a transatlantic journey, although, you know, some have, you know, in the other direction from, from Latin America with Afro-Latinx Italians, but across the Mediterranean in a kind of post-colonial, through a post-colonial story. And so in my thinking about the Black Mediterranean, I draw a lot of my inspiration from Cedric Robinson and Black Marxism. And, mm -hmm. you know, in his introduction to Black Marxism, what Robin Kelly says is that for Robinson, the Black Mediterranean in many ways was the precondition for the Black Atlantic because we saw, right, patterns of racialization. We saw, uh, you know, exploitation of labor, um, you know, experiments with plantation economies, networks of financing that in many ways became a template for transatlantic expansion. And that at the same time, uh, what he calls the exorcising of the Black Mediterranean from kind of the story of Europe is also what produces the idea of Europe as white. Mm -hmm. So what I'm interested in doing in my own work is to say, how do we understand the Black Mediterranean, not just as a precondition for the Black Atlantic, but how do we understand the ways in which a Black Mediterranean is also being reproduced in the present? And how do we do that in a way where we're not simply reading it as the kind of afterlife of transatlantic slavery? Right, how do, we, how do we take seriously those specificities? While also understanding that, you know, racial, racial formation and the circulation of racial ideologies is also a global process. So, you know, while there were a, a set of debates that were very specific to Italian national formation and, and colonialism, that, you know, some of Italy's most premier liberal racial theorists like Lombroso also had influence on the other side of the Atlantic too. But the last thing I'll say is that in addition to using the Black Atlantic as an analytical category, I also like to think of it as a political demand as well. So as a political category as well. So going back to what I was saying earlier with these struggles over citizenship and the ways in which Black Italian activists sort of confront the limits of citizenship as a means of, uh, say, challenging the racial state, does the Black Mediterranean also give us a, a kind of blueprint for other political possibilities of transgressive alliances that are subverting these state-imposed distinctions between, you know, immigrants versus people who were born here versus refugees? Um, does it provide a basis for a different kind of solidarity that's maybe less based on those kind of liberal categories of state recognition and more on whether it's shared experiences of Southernness or shared histories of anti-colonial resistance? Mm, thank you. That resonates with me so deeply. My research is on is in uh, is in coastal Sicily, and so I'm constantly thinking about the Mediterranean because it's outside my window. But one of the things that's been kind of that has really haunted me is the fact that the Mediterranean has been and continues to be a space in which Italy has experimented with expanding borders, constricting borders and genocidal violence. And so I want to keep in mind that, um, one thing to keep in mind is that Italy experimented with concentration camps in North Africa. It continues to, well, Frontex and the European Union border control and Italy specifically, they continue to experiment with ways, one, to sometimes save migrants and sometimes in very flagrant ways, let them die uh, in the sea. And so we have the Mediterranean as a site of African death being uh, 
with not consistent, but happening over, in multiple time periods. At the same time, we have people who are crossing this, this semi-porous border-ish space into Italy who are acting these border crossers would be what I call very transgressive in this sense. And so one thing I really struggle to weigh with the question of the Mediterranean is how is it all a site of um, uh, agent of action where people subvert kind of state policies. Italy, I, I, what I consider, Italy, Italy funds uh, racist state violence in Libya under the guise of anti-trafficking is what I said. And so I think I really struggle to understand how do we think of the Mediterranean as a place of both uh, mobility, transgressive mobility, migrant arrivals, but also hold that grapple with the weight of ongoing African death in this space. And so that's something I really try to think about in both. Uh, and I think that's where the question of Black Lives Matter really speaks to me is in Sicily, there are struggles for getting food in migrant centers, getting healthcare in migrant centers, getting toothpaste in migrant centers. And in these spaces, I think, yeah, there are struggles for these, there are protests. Um, and the question of the question of Black Lives Matters has been very, I think, material and about kind of basic needs in life and death. Uh, itself. And so that's what that really speaks to me. That's how that kind of conversation really speaks to me. I wanted to ask, um, just as we're about to move into our question answer section, I want to ask if, um, first and uh, for Angelica, if there are any kind of political, Camila has given us a lot of background about the, the profound political movements that have been uh, going on in Italy, whether it's for citizenship, belonging, uh, expanding the idea of who is Italian and who isn't. Are there any political concerns, political issues in this current moment about BLM or more broadly that are really on your radar in terms of blackness and race in Italy? Well, um, mm, you know, as I was saying earlier, I noticed that there was this pre George Floyd and post George Floyd. And one of the uh, outcomes of the post George Floyd um, is that in Italy now racism is under strict, uh, is, is, is looked upon. We talk much more about racism and uh, racist uh, crimes. Mm, you know, we had recently uh, the murder of a 21 year old uh, young Italian uh, man, uh, William Montero Duarte, who was killed um, in, in a brutal um, in a brutal crime out near Rome uh, in, um, in in a town near Rome, and so it was interesting to see the reactions to that story because I think if this would have happened before, probably we would have talked about it, but yes, would have been on the news for um, like a day and then it would have gone. Now that story was really catching a lot of attention and you could see the frictions that the Black Lives Matter movement brought also here in Italy. So uh, as you were saying earlier, Torin, how young people are really making a difference. And this is something I totally agree with. I noticed that, for example, when I went to Milan for uh, the um, demonstration uh, organized after the death of George Floyd on the 7th of June, and in Milan, what was shocking was the age of the people there protesting. They were incredibly young people, but also very aware very knowledgeable uh, people who are in touch with the world uh, through social media and how social media is used as a way to educate yourself in a country where if you switch on the TV, uh, you don't see society represented. If you switch on TV, everyone is still white in Italy. We still have people doing blackface. We don't talk about race. Uh, and so I think how the social media in this context, they've been incredibly helpful. Um, and so it was interesting to see the reaction to that murder and how it's difficult to mention the word racism, uh, even when it's blatant in a way. So this specific story, without going into details, was a, um, a, number, of, a number of factors created this murder, toxic, toxic masculinity, um, homophobia, um, 
racism was one of these. However, there was a strong uh, reluctance to mention the word racism, while it was very easy to label the two suspected murders as fascist. Mm -hmm. So I found that was really interesting because they were labeled as fascist and they were not fascists. They were not even politically active, these two people, but it was easier to say they were fascists rather than say they were racist. Because this implies that actually we need to talk about racism, that racism is not just the act of two men. Racism is something much more structural and systemic. And so I noticed how the Black Lives Movement this matter movement in Italy brought about real tension about this young Italy uh, that really wants to know about it, wants to create a better society, is fighting for social justice and mention race explicitly. And this kind of old school uh, white anti-racism that is a bit obsolete now, is a bit inadequate, that doesn't want to uh, self-reflect on themselves. So it's a really interesting period to see how anti-racism and where anti-racism uh, is going at the, at the moment. That's fascinating. The preference is causal and fascist rather than racist. That is, uh, I think there are interesting historical legacies there. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Amelia, can I turn to you? What is, uh, I know you've, you've, been very, you've been very involved in contemporary political activism in Italy, can you tell us a little more about how that might dovetail with Black Lives Matters and what might be some interesting points of departure? Angelica's really put us, uh, raise our awareness of maybe the international overlap um, and attentiveness as you have two questions of uh, George Floyd and others in the US kind of, could you share with us, share with us some more insights you have around that? Yeah. So, so I agree. I mean, this, you know, this question of, you know, whether someone is, is, you know, a fascist or a racist is, is really fascinating. And, you know, I, I think part of doing this kind of work in Italy means having lots of conversations with people who, you know, turn white as sheets when you say that your work deals with razza. Oh. Um, and I think that there's, I think that there's a way in which fascism as a label allows a kind of distancing, because if you call someone a fascist, right, then you are calling them the worst of the worst, deplorable, Nazi, just unconscionably terrible. Um, so it allows for a kind of distancing between, right, that person and a narrative of Italiani brava gente, especially because of the ways that legacies of, you know, the, the partigiani and anti-fascist resistance are often used, again, to kind of um, paint fascism as this, um, as a, a deviation, right, from a much more uh, uh, convivial history of race relations in Italy. Um, as far as, you know, what's, what's happening right now, and especially the international connections, you know, one thing that I think is also important to remember, and this is not at all to discount the, the significance of this moment, is that this is also not the first time that there were protests happening under the, the banner of Black Lives Matter in Italy. Um, and I, you know, I think back to 2000 and the summer of 2016, it was um, a summer, many journalists called it, you know, the summer that Black Lives Matter went global where there were protests in Brazil and in London and in Amsterdam and in Paris and also in Italy. That was the summer when Emmanuel Chidi Namdi was murdered. Emmanuel mm -hmm. Chidi Namdi was um, a Nigerian asylum seeker uh, who came to Italy with his partner. Um, they were, uh, you know, they were basically living in Fermo as asylees. And um, when he and his his partner went for a walk, they were, well, basically the there were racial epithets that were shouted at his partner. Um, and then when he moved to defend this woman, he was he was beaten to death and fell into a coma and, and passed away. And again, actually to go back to Angelica's point, the, the difficulty that co political commentators had in calling that an act of racism was, um, was shocking and became, for lack of a better word, because I think part of being an ethnographer is taking these sort of brutally shocking moments and and rereading them as ethnographically useful anecdotes. I think it's a bit of a survival strategy when you're in the field. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, the way in which people would say everything like, you know, this is about the death of the human in all of us, or this was about xenophobia, but you know, no one would say that this was about racism and anti-blackness. And this happened also with the, the spate of um, 
uh, murders that happened also during 2018. So there was a moment already when, you know, Black Italians were, were using the language of Black Lives Matter um, as a way to, uh, let's say, consolidate uh, movement building and, and draw attention to anti-Black violence in Italy. But I think the scale of this moment is really unprecedented. And I think also because, you know, from 2016 to now, there's another four years of really kind of concerted organizing both at the kind of formal political level, but also socially around Black or Afro-Italian identity and representation. Um, so, you know, again, what I think that there's also, so how can I say this? I think that there are narratives that we have to be careful to avoid when we're thinking about the transnational connections. And again, this is something Angelica and I have written about particularly in sort of US-based media, looking outward at the way that Black Lives Matter has circulated in other places, there's a tendency to sort of suggest that the US is farther along in terms of Black politics, um, that these political strategies and tools are diffusing from the US outward. And then, you know, Black people in France or in Italy, thanks to Black Americans, are discovering their Blackness and going out into the streets and mobilizing. And so I say that just because while it's important to, to look at the international dimensions, you know, what are the ways in which, you know, the post George Floyd moment has reinvigorated these black struggles in Italy. It's also important to understand that this most recent wave of mobilizations didn't emerge out of a vacuum, right, but that it's really the product of, you know, generations of anti-colonial struggle, of migrants' rights activism around labor, the citizenship re re reform movement, this burgeoning Black Italian movement that has in many ways been reinvigorated by Black Lives Matter and has also taken some of the calls and demands around Black Lives Matter and, and repurposed it to meet the, the kind of specificities of, of Blackness in Italy, whether it's around the citizenship question or around deaths in the Mediterranean or about you know, the exploitation of migrant labor in the, in the, the you know, tomato ghettos of Southern Italy. Mm. Um, one of the things that I've been really interested in, I don't have an answer to this question yet, is, you know, to what extent the language of abolition um, has, has legs, you know, for mm. lack of a better word in, mm. in Italy, right? So there's a way in which discussions around abolition in the US context, um, have been reinvigorated during the, you know, the long uh, summer of 2020 and have focused particularly on policing and prisons because of the way in which the, kind, the, 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 tentac the tentacular reach of carcerality sort of extends from the prison and policing into so many aspects of Black mm -hmm. life. So it makes so much sense to start there. But in Italy, what would be the starting point of an abolitionist project if the kind of primary issue that people are mobilizing around is not police violence? And can the language of abolition be used as a way to think about um, immigrant detention and border fortification? Mm -hmm. And so for those questions, I actually draw a lot of inspiration from Angela Davis. Um, you know, a few years ago, she said that, you know, the refugee struggle is, you know, the kind of central struggle of the 21st century. And she, you know, uses a kind of racial capitalist lens to think about even the, the private economic interests that, you know, link, for instance, uh, mass incarceration in the U.S., immigrant detention in Europe, and also settler colonialism in Palestine, Israel, that there are particular networks of expertise and financing um, and, and capital, right, that actually undergird these systems across a lot of different geographical spaces. So can that become, uh, you know, the way in which to think about what abolition looks like in the Italian context? Yes. Thank you so much, both of you, Camille and Angelica, for your really profoundly fascinating and thought-provoking responses. I want to give us a little bit of time to look into uh, look into the Q and A section, and I'm going to pose uh, respond to some of these. Uh, questions. Looks like we have some about kind of thinking further back in um, Italian history and how do you think about pre pre prior to the 19th, uh, David, is that you? No? Uh, prior hey, to the 19th, David, yeah, Torin, can I jump in? Please go for it. Okay. Hey, everyone out there in the audience. Um, I'd like to remind you to pose questions down in the Q&A. Sharika and I 
have been monitoring those questions. We'll pass them along to Torin to pose to the panel. So our first question is from uh, Emanuele Lugli, pardon my phonetic pronunciation. And they write, this conversation was fascinating, many thanks. Are there books or researchers that you all could recommend? You spoke of Angelo Del Boca's excellent Italiane Brava Gente. You also mentioned the work of whitening of um, Gia Giuliani. And of course there is your own work, but are there other important texts that you could suggest? Many thanks. So, um, right. Um, okay, maybe I can give some references here, but maybe, I don't know, we can also provide a more extensive uh, reading list uh, to post uh, somewhere, maybe on the website or uh, somewhere, um, yeah. Um, so I was mentioning Bianco e Nero, uh, Gaia Giuliani and Cristina Lombardi Dio, that was, uh, is in Italian. And it's a, it's a fantastic book because they really did an extensive uh, job in order to uh, put race really at, at the core of the matter. Um, another book that was really interesting and really useful at the time, it was 2012, I think, was uh, Postcolonial Italy. That was an edited collection of so several essays, um, many actually short, but really uh, very diverse, talking about this post-colonial Italy. What, what, what does it mean to say post-colonial Italy? So um, then there was another one, Parlare di Razza, by Anna Scacchi and Tatiana Petrovic. That was also an incredible book. Uh, in terms of history, obviously, there is a very long list we could give. Angelo Del Boca, as I mentioned, wrote extensively about it. Uh, we have now also a, a new generation of scholars, of young scholars who put race in uh, historiography. And so I think about uh, Valeria De Plano, for example, who works on citizenship. Uh, precisely uh, at the end of World War II and how, uh, something we mentioned earlier, for example, how for Libyans was easier to get citizenship in comparison to Eritreans and Somali, precisely because even if the racial laws had been abolished, they were still silently being used. Um, so Valeria De Plano, is, uh, she wrote recently a couple of very good books, uh, uh, Alessandro Pes. So we have many young uh, authors, uh, really, really good. Uh, and as I said, maybe we can, um, because we, we won't have time to answer all this question, I guess we can, yes, post something later on uh, for sure, including a, a reading list. And um, yes, I don't know if Camilla wants to add some more references. Maybe just uh, yeah, two just a yeah, just a couple really quickly. So I would, you know, also to the list of, you know, especially that that kind of earlier generation of historians, like people like Alessandro Triulzi, Fabrizio De Donno, um, and then um, there's also um, Giulia Barrera, um, Alessandro Portelli. Um, I noticed that Stephanie Malia Ham is is in the audience. I really recommend her book Empire's Mobius Strip, which looks specifically at the connections between Italian. Uh, practices of regulating mobility under colonialism and the fortification of the Mediterranean today. Um, and then I also just want to put in a plug for all of the non-academic literature and art that's being produced by Black Italians, because in many ways, I think that as scholars, our timelines are so much slower and we're sort of trying to keep up with the incredible cultural production of Black Italian artists now. So, you know, Ija Bashego, Gabriela Germandi, um, Cristina Fara, um, uh, goodness. Um, and then filmmakers like, you know, Medin Paulos or Ariam Tecle. Uh, there's so many other sites of knowledge production about Blackness and Black Italian um, histories outside of academia that are worth mentioning as well. And, and maybe Angelica, I'll just put in a plug for the fact that we also have a book that's hopefully coming out soon about the Black Mediterranean as well with Paul Grave McMillan. Awesome. Thank you so much. I would, to that list, I'll try to add things quickly. I would add Maurizio Al-Bahari's uh, Crimes of Peace, which is about, exactly about Italian monitoring of the Mediterranean border, which is, uh, I think, a really important read. Um, I would add Donald Carter's States of Grace, because he does, I think, he does a really good job of trying to connect um, 
both West African social processes to racial policies developing in colonial East Africa and to migrants and their experiences in Italy. So uh, in addition to all the other scholars and artists and writers we've heard, I would just add those two among many others. But thank you for that question. Uh, can you vote okay. Grace? Uh, David Asharka, do you have another one to share? Yes, so I have some more to um, share. There's a lot of questions, so I'm gonna, Dave's gonna do uh, some of them, but the questions I'm gonna present for you are we have quite a few questions on history. So there's a very specific question for Torin um, about what kind of support systems do migrants you, you work with have, and minor migrants in Southern Italy, but there's a broad plethora of historical questions for all three of you. So Marsha Chalena asks, are historical examples of racially ethnically mixed communities in what is now Italy relevant to current black and non-white Italians? thinking of Sicily 1900, sorry, 900 to 1091-ish, 16th century Venice, perhaps also Rome during the Roman Empire. Camilla did touch on this, and I know in the UK there's increasing interest in the Black presence pre-20th century immigration. Richard McGrail also asks about 14th and 15th century conflicts with Spain and the Catholic Church. And Thomas Hansen, asks, um, when I worked in Netherlands for some years, I noticed that many Dutch made a distinction between those who had come from the former Dutch colonies in the Antilles, Indonesia, Suriname, etc., and more recent migrants from elsewhere. The former were often seen as more acceptable because they knew some Dutch and were part of our history, often portrayed as gentle and mercantile, of course, as opposed to recent migrants from various parts of North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa who were seen as more difficult and more alien. Are there similar logics at work in Italy? And we also have an anonymous attendee who wanted, who wanted to ask about, if you have time, the largest mass lynching involving Italians, but I'm not entirely sure I can specify more than that. So if you have a chance. So these are kind of broad historical questions that I hope that we can uh, answer. Thank you so much. I will take up one minute and then pass it off to Camila and Angelica, just in response to resources for unaccompanied foreign minors from Africa with whom I did research in Sicily. There's an answer to that question is different if you ask whether it was now or maybe pre-2018, when a pretty far, when a pretty, when a coalition of, I, I would say, far-right, populist, nationalist uh, people were elected into office. And so originally uh, migrants were, young migrants were supposed to have psychologists, basic needs, education, and the tools they need to quote unquote, integrate into Italian society. Those never really arrived for migrants. There was, there's huge bureaucratic chaos and uh, a lot of corruption in the migrant funding systems and the migrant care systems in Sicily. So that's why I mentioned earlier for me the what I consider what might be termed under BLM in Sicily for a lot of migrants means getting shoes, getting toothpaste, uh, getting maybe one Italian lesson a week. Things have gotten worse since 2018 because partner led by government well, the, the most famous figure in this would be Salvini has, has campaigned successfully to decrease funding for many efforts to care for migrants. So their resources are few and far between at this moment. I would like to pass it off perhaps maybe to Angelica first to address questions of history and maybe pre, maybe it sounds like 10th to 16th century, uh, maybe eight to 16th century Italian history and how that might come into play if I remember, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I remember uh, one I can definitely answer, as I touched upon earlier, someone was asking about the lynching of, of Italians. And so the lynching I was referring to uh, occurred in um, 1891, and 11 Italians were lynched by a mob for the uh, alleged murder of a um, city police chief in New Orleans. And it's interesting because if you read how the media uh, responded to that lynching is quite uh, is quite shocking. Uh, the consideration there was for Italians, and also some make references to blacks. So. I think the governor of Louisiana at the time said how Italians uh, were uh, 
worse than blacks because they were filthier and lazier. Um, and so you see this connection between race and color I was mentioning earlier. Uh, also, I think I heard something about um, this distinction uh, made in the Netherlands uh, between migrants coming from the former colonies and migrants coming from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I think this is really interesting and is definitely a global a global uh, labeling uh, because even uh, in Italy is the same. Somehow, uh, if you come from certain countries, uh, some people may remember the colonial heritage and so Eritreans and Somali by some people may be considered as uh, better migrants. Uh, Eritrean women came to Italy and many were working as uh, um, maids uh, and nannies. And so there is a sort of colonial memory uh, that has traveled uh, through the Mediterranean. And definitely African migrants, uh, whatever this label is, uh, migrant, African migrants is a label I'm not very comfortable with because I, fi I find it a very dehumanizing term, but the black body, the male black body coming from a boat in the Mediterranean, this is the stereotype that has been inculcated a bit in Italian, in Italian society, and that is probably the worst. So that's why when uh, we were talking about George Floyd earlier, you know, when there were the protests, I it was interesting to see how many people were really sad and angry about the murder of this black man in the US. But I was wondering if the same black man would have walked in Italian streets, would have been sat on an Italian bus, you know, how he would have been treated. So it was interesting how, to see how blackness can be framed in a certain way if it's geographically uh, distant and how it's much more difficult to deal with a certain blackness when is local, when is your neighbor, when is the person working for you uh, and not even with you, uh, considering how segregated is still Italian society. But I, I want to leave the space also for Camilla in case she wants to answer some of the questions. Uh, thank you. Um, so, you know, to the, you know, I'm not, I'm not an historian, uh, but, you know, I will say to the question of you know, the kind of 14th, 15th, 16th century. I think that um, David Thiel Goldberg has, has written about this in the context of racial Europeanization and particularly the, the figure of the Muslim as one of the, the, the others against which Europe has historically defined itself. And, and Stuart Hall has also written about, you know, the end of the 15th century as this really important moment in the consolidation of Europe or the West as a category that happens relationally with, you know, the expulsion of the Moors, the Inquisition and forcible conversion of Jews, as well as, um, you know, colonial expansion across the Atlantic. And so I think that that is, you know, that is an important story. And again, it's also, it's, it's a Mediterranean history in many ways. Um, to, to return to the question about you know these these histories of plurality and the ways in which they are they're you know potentially used to make political claims in the present, I think that that you know from what I've seen that is something that activists act actively draw on whether it's you know the the kind of deeper history of the Mediterranean or kind of more recent histories of. Um, you know, in much in in the sort of this the similar spirit to Angelica's work of kind of shining light on these hidden black histories as a way of pushing back against the narrative that blackness is inherently foreign to Italianness. Um, there was a, a wonderful scholar who, who passed away recently, Mauro Valeri, who actually did, wrote a, a number of really wonderful books about um, these, these black figures in Italian history that you know, have been overlooked for far too long. And so it's been really interesting to see, because you know, on the one hand, I think that there is sometimes a tendency, particularly among you know, kind of white liberals, both you know, scholars and also you know, activists in Italy, to use this history of Mediterranean plurality as a way of saying, you know, we can, we can romanticize the Mediterranean. It's always been this space of intermixing. And the fortification of the border now is this deviation from a longer history of exchange. And I'm skeptical, skeptical about that argument because when you actually look at the history really closely, the Mediterranean has always been a site of struggle over racial boundaries. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there's a really, um, 
there's a really um, kind of tongue in cheek way in which I see black activists play with that history of plurality and contestation effectively to say, you know, talk back to the Italian nation and say, you know, y'all can't even decide who counts as an Italian. So who are you to tell us that we aren't? Mm. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask something to you, Torin, because you said you work on Sicily. And what I noticed, uh, which is really difficult to deal with, is sometimes how blackness is appropriated a bit by sudden and saying, we are like you, we have been discriminated as you have been, so we're all the same. And when you point out that actually uh, is a big difference, you know, that uh, you have been discriminated, but after all, you are white. I noticed there is a lot of resistance. Uh, and specifically, I remember I was talking to someone about uh, racism and I was saying how a white person in a way will never be able to understand what racism is, although you can be an excellent ally. And someone was saying, but uh, I'm Sicilian. My, my, my family went to, went to the US, they experienced racism. How can you say that? And I find uh, that was very challenging <laughs> to, to explain and to talk about. So because you're working on, in Sicily, on Sicily, I was wondering if you notice any, any, any sort of uh, similar um, yeah, matters. Yeah, thank you for that question. One, I also want to, uh, in a response, I want to first say that I understand that. I imagine that both your research and Camila's takes a lot of uh, emotional energy and difficult kind of very personal level to navigate. And I'm sure you feel strongly about it in many ways. So one, just thank you for your research. And then two, yes, it is, it's, it's very, I will say infuriating. I would say it's frustrating. One, because um, having discussions around whiteness and blackness in Sicily almost inevitably leads to the response, well, siamo Arabi, we're all Arabs, so we can't be racist, but I've seen you like one person might turn around to me and say, oh, that migrant is rude to me, but Africans don't respect women. African men don't respect women. And I would say, well, that's a problematic statement. And they say, well, we're, I'm Arab, so it can't be. And so I found it to be a really interesting kind of intellectual block, discursive block to deeper conversations about race, because one, there isn't a willingness to acknowledge that uh, you can be non-white and still be racist, or that you can be also white and non-white at the same time, depending, depending on your context. So those conversations were spot on, I think, were challenging in a way described it precisely in that Sicilian whiteness, Italian whiteness has always been a question, and especially Sicilian whiteness, although they have become much more white, they don't fit into kind of predominant understandings of what it means to be a white European. And so, discussing racism there is a challenge because you first have to get a, find a way to get past kind of the, the discursive intellectual block of, well, we are not necessarily white, we are African-ish by some standards. And so, yes, uh, I found it to be profoundly true and to be one thing that really hindered kind of interpersonal between migrants and oftentimes migrants and staff, it really hindered their conversations around race, um, what you just pointed out. So yeah, thank you for that. Is it, um, I think, is there time for one more question or are we gonna wrap up uh, Sharika and David? Let's take, um, we're just at time. Let's take five more minutes and then we'll cut it off. We've had two questions about gender. Um, how does gender play into attitudes towards black Italians? Are there specific ideas and values attached to Italian masculinity and femininity that enter into the discourses on race and Italianness? And also from Candace Whitney, they asked a question about public responses to murders. Um, and there's this question about African migrant women who go unnamed. Um, can you touch on these larger themes of how gender intersects with race in Italy? Thanks. And this will be our last question. Thank you so much, David. Do you mind if I throw that question to you first, Camila? Uh, sure, and then I'll, I'll say a few words, but then I'll throw it to Angelica because this is very central to her work. But you know, I think that there are there are different kinds of um, gendered understandings that are at play. Um, so you know, I think Angelica mentioned, and, and you know, we saw this, for instance, with um, the response, particularly the 2015 refugee crisis, that there was a sort of in media representations there was a bifurcation between. Um, 
you know, what was seen as the Syrian family that was to be pitied and cared for versus the single male African migrant that was a, that was a source of danger. There's a different kind of uh, gendered racism that adheres to black women. And I think that has to be understood within the kind of broader context of, you know, debates about the, the social reproduction of the Italian nation and these hand wringing about declining birth rates and the graying of the Italian population where the fear is, you know, of African women who are going to come to Italy just to give birth to children. Uh, who will then make claims to Italian citizenship. And so, you know, again, there's, we see this, what Philomena Essen calls a kind of gendered racism at play where, you know, it's the single, single black male who's seen as a source of danger and criminality. Um, and then the, you know, the, the African woman who's seen as a source of kind of dangerous fertility. Um, and that also maps onto a set, you know, differences that we see between the way that um, black, uh, black migrants in general are being talked about in the media and responded to by politicians, you know, differently from uh, refugees from other from other parts of the world. But I'll stop. Thank you so much. Yes, um, definitely the gender component. I notice how gender and race and citizenship actually have been exploited a lot by the political discourse from the not only from the right wing, but also from uh, the left wing, especially during the 2017-2018 electoral campaign. Uh, black women's body was explicitly used to uh, promote um, so social hatred. And so I wrote about it um, when uh, there was this politician from uh, the far right uh, wing, uh, Fratelli d'Italia, saying how Italy cannot become Africa's delivery room. We cannot allow all these black women to come to Italy, procreate, and then having children who can become Italians. That's why we should not change the citizenship law. So I, I thought this was really interesting to use women's reproductive functions. On the one hand, to um, how, how white women's body was used uh, as procreator of the nation, as uh, as Camilla was saying, white women reproduce the nation, so we have to be careful. And black women contaminate the nation with this threat, and so citizenship again, blood is the key is is the key matter here. So definitely something gender, race are incredibly linked with citizenship and identity. And. Uh, um, I don't know if we have time for another, there was another question, I think, um, uh, I can't remember, it was about the reaction of, of the murders, I think. Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. It's interesting to see, to see some cases that made history in a way. Camilla was mentioning Emmanuel Chidinamdi case that was talked a lot about it, but again, there was a lot of reluctance to name the word racist murder. Mm, again, the, 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 who committed the crime was someone uh, close to uh, extreme right-wing party. So again, he was labeled as a fascist. Race was not, was not in the picture. Abbas murder in 2008 was uh, was really um, was another of those cases who made history. But again, in Milan and Camilla probably I don't know if you were there at the time, but in Milan the reaction was really really strong. And Abba memory is uh, honored every year because the activist created association uh, competition contest named after Abba. Ididien. That was shocking. I was here. It was in Florence when it happened. And I have to say, it was um, really shameful the way the media talked about it and how also uh, the city reacted about it. There were anti-racist organizations who were uh, demonstrating in the streets, who uh, tried to remember Edidien's uh, memory. But the mayor of Florence got really angry when the Senegalese community uh, broke um, some uh, pottery in the city center. Um, Edidien was, was not the first time that, uh, that a black man was killed in Florence. Florence, unfortunately, has this history of killing black, of shooting black men. 
And so uh, in 2001, it happened with uh, Gianluca Casseri, who killed three, uh, two men, Senegalese men. And Ididien was killed in the same way, passing on a bridge and shot by uh, Roberto Pirrone. And so when the community got angry, the mayor called them savages, violent. Florence cannot accept that. And so it was very frustrating to see again how race was really not in the picture. And then with, with Willie, as I mentioned earlier, the story was different. Willie caught global attention. Journalists were coming from all over the world to try to understand what was happening. And it was interesting to see how the Italian media talked about it and the foreign media talked about it, especially British and Americans. Uh, it was really different. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm so yeah. sorry because we have to sort of wrap up. That's yeah. all the time we have. And I just want to thank Camilla Horton, Angelica Pessarini, and Torin Jones for a wonderful conversation. It was one of the most engaging webinars I've at least thank attended you. for a very long. Thank you so much. And I think it's a measure of how wonderful the conversation was. That there's so many questions we didn't even get to answer about abolition and so on. But thank you. And I want to remind all the... Um, attendees that we'll update the reading list for the for the page. So if you go to the events page for this, we will update the reading list on there. And I'd like to thank our event co-sponsors, the Europe Center and the Department of Anthropology at Stanford. And I want to remind you all that we have our next event in this series, Black Lives Matter in Australia, a conversation with Professor Marcia Langton is going to be released. It's a pre-recorded video release and is available for viewing on October the 23rd. It's a very, very powerful powerful interview with Marcy Langton talking about the relationship of Black Lives Matter to um, Australian Torres Strait Islanders and Aboriginal communities and incarceration and custodial um, deaths in Australia. And for more information about that event and all of our events, including this event in the Methods of Protest series, you can visit iriss.stanford.edu forward slash ethnography. So thank you again for all our panelists and thank you for being here, all our attendees and asking such great questions and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.